Welcome to Get After It with Nashi, brought to you by Ace Property Management and Sales. Oh, Corey, thank you for joining me. It's it's funny how Instagram does these sort of people that maybe you've you've never heard of or not seen before come up on your feed, and then you're instantly drawn into their their persona and their their page and start following. And that's what happened with me and your page in the, the Environmental yeah. Cowboy. So, as I say, thank you for coming on and. Um, welcome, and it's it's just the environment and w- what we're doing as humans to our world is is very interesting to me. And I thought you and I have an, a bit of a blether. You can probably educate me in a lot of things that I and we as a as a humanity can do better. And I hope you um, you take this opportunity to try and just get in front of more people because the message that you're putting out there is extremely important. Yeah, I appreciate you for ha- having me on, mate, and those, those kind words. Um, I-, I love talking about this stuff, so any time I can um, bring you right back to the beginning where I brought up, yeah. if you like. Yeah, a bit of a story. Right, yeah, so I uh, am extremely passionate about, you know, environment and people. I grew up on a 30,000-acre cattle station, central Queensland, Carnarvon Gorge, if anyone Googles that. It's very beautiful rich sandstone country um a lot of gorges rivers a lot of aboriginal rock art all down the the rivers uh, and everything and we uh grew up riding horses uh, along um the edge with a few few cattle and i spent a lot of time i was homeschooled i spent a lot of time after school which is lunchtime you know you'd be only work do school from eight till 12 every day i had a lot of free time so i'd spend a lot of time in the creek uh, and uh, I got very interested in birds, watching birds uh, as, a, as a young kid. And I had a scientific journal at eight years old and I'd go there and sit right on the edge of the waterhole, this particular creek. I wouldn't build a cubby house or anything around me to, so that they couldn't see me. I, I wanted the birds to interact with me and I would record their behaviour of how they interacted with me. So I guess from a really young age, I was interested in that direct relationship that we have with nature and how we interact with it. Um, I, th- I think that's where my interest in, in environmental science came from originally. But also I remember us going through a really hard drought when I was young, um, about five or six years uh, long drought that we went through and the, the um, family on the neighbouring cattle station that was, um, you know, it was a normal family. Mum, dad uh, had a, just one daughter and we were quite close with them. The daughter was pretty, you know, um, close to my age. So we went over there and um, they, they were an hour away, so, but they were neighbours basically. Um, and I remember this phone call one morning, uh, four o'clock in the morning, my dad picked up and the wife was on the phone and all she could get out was, you need to come here right now. Uh, so we knew it was pretty serious and we went there and the husband, the, the father had shot himself in the middle of the paddock at the height of the drought uh, with no explanation, nothing, just um, just took his own life because he thought that his family would be better off without him. He felt like a, a failure, I guess. And uh, because of, of the drought, of how hard it was out there as well. So it drilled down even deeper into me at that age and, and the ripple effects that I saw throughout the community after that suicide um, of how, how we are directly connected to nature itself and what we do to nature, we essentially are doing to ourselves. Um, it's directly related to mental health issues. So I think that was just burnt into me, into my heart and my mind from um, a very young age. I went on naturally to study environmental science, environmental planning at university on the Sunshine Coast. And then I went into um, an environmental professional career after that. Uh, I'm now uh, 11. I'm into my 11th year, over a decade now of environmental science across a number of different industries uh, uh, mainly the resource industry over the last 10 years, but now I'm stepping into carbon farming. I've been involved with carbon farming for the last six years at least, but in and out of that industry, but carbon farming is one of the two solutions to solve climate change really. It's renewable energy and we have to draw down the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere as well, and that's basically regeneration of nature. And so I go back out on those cattle stations now 
And I say to the farmer, well, your tree is worth more standing than cleared. And if you look after nature, if you look after the soil, you can get paid for that. So it's basically what I do is, is giving the farmer a financial incentive to grow trees, to grow, um, uh, to, to improve soil health, et cetera, et cetera. So I feel like that I'm giving back to community and to environment in that way. Um, I found my real core passion through that. I know that um, by doing what I do, it's improving mental health and um, it's improving the economy, but it's also improving the environment at, at the same time. So in a, in a nutshell, we can go deeper into that type of stuff if you like, but in a nutshell, that's, that's what I do. I think um, I really uh, have found a, a purpose in life and it's really crucial that everyone finds that purpose and because that's ultimately fulfilling. And the, the, it's inter- interesting, actually, the... Um, I learned that from a young age too. On, on our cattle station, we had lots of Aboriginal rock art all through our place. And there was, there was a theory back in the day by Graham Walsh, who was Australia's greatest rock art expert at the time, who my dad was mates with. He came up with this theory that the, the left hand painted on the sandstone walls was a symbol for giving power back to the earth. And that was often associated around burials. So the Aboriginals would bury the bodies back into the earth. So that was giving power back to the earth. The right hand was for receiving power, so taking from the land, you know, taking food, taking water, etc. So it's this really powerful circle of life. And if you study Indigenous cultures around the world, they have a similar principle, like the Lion King, for example, in yeah. Africa, that was the circle of life. And the Native American Indians had a similar concept um, or a proverb that they used to say, is where the blood in your veins, when the blood in your veins returns to the ocean and the rivers and, and your bones to dust in the ground, it is then that you'll remember that the land does not belong to you, that you belong to the land. It's a really strong principle that guided everything that they did, environmental management rise and, and everything that they did on the land is that they, they believed of themselves as a part of nature and not above nature itself. So it's integrating their economy, their management structures, all systems as, as a part of nature, um, uh, aligning their work with nature, not against it. The Western culture is against it, 100% against it. Everything that we do is like stripping from the land. It's taking, taking, taking. It's using that right hand and just taking as much as we can, not giving it back. We found ourselves in a lot of trouble at the moment where we're just taking too much and the environment can't handle it. And this is why we're finding ourselves in this extreme sort of situations like climate change. Um, yeah, so I guess that sort of gives you a very long-winded roundabout uh, explanation of, of why I do what I do and why I love doing it as well. How are you, um, are you challenged a lot by your views and the way you sort of, you're, you're trying to improve the world, but do you get a lot of negative feedback on, on the way you, you put it across? Um. I've got to say at the moment, probably not. I think when I first started, absolutely, um, but not anymore. I think that the environmental conscious mind shit set, mindset shift is, um, is fast approaching in this world and that's made it a lot easier for people like me to be able to talk about this stuff. It's more socially accepted, acceptable now. It's kind of like talking about um you know racism issues or or um the gay marriage debate you know 20 years ago if you start talking about that you'd get a bit of flack for it um you'd be standing alone most of the time but now you know gay marriage is legalized the, if you if you're homophobic or whatever you get slammed for that type of thing so it's kind of the same as environmentalism it's not slammed anymore it, it used to be um i guess my one thing I haven't explained is the environmental cowboy persona, which you, you mentioned. I, to start with, especially to start with, you know, um, six or seven years ago, even going back that far, I uh, uh, found it very difficult to talk about these type of issues, exactly as you're saying. Got a lot of negative feedback um, originally. Um, and, and that was because there was a misunderstanding of environmental science and the, and the messages that I was giving just a miscommunication, misunderstanding. Um, the climate science messages, the environmental science messages are often very complex and people make them complex. And scientists, 
in general are very bad at communicating those messages. And so I figured out, you know, early on in my career that we've got a miscommunication problem. There's a massive um, gap between uh, academic science, industry, and the public. And I, I guess that I built this persona called the Environmental Cowboy, which aims to deliver uh, um, environmental climate messages and solutions in a way that's more entertaining, in a way that's more relatable to the public, to industry, to people in general, so that um, it, the messages get across, across better and more clearly. Um, I, and like anything, when I first started, it was pretty difficult to get those messages across because I wasn't very good at delivering them. But like anything, you know, the more you do it, uh, the better you get at it. And I'm okay at it now, I hope, um, in delivering uh, environmental and climate messages and solutions, or well, the challenges and the, and the solutions. And um, I really don't get that much negative feedback anymore, which is wonderful, you know, which means it's, it's, uh, it's working to some extent. As an example, and a testament to the way that you get your message across, I urge any listeners to go to the Environmental Cowboy YouTube page and watch the video where uh, Corey comes in dressed as the earth. <laughs> because but Corey, that, that made a hell of a lot of sense to me. And when you, yeah. when you went into uh, dressed as the earth and you went into the office and I think spoke to your boss and said, hey boss, I need some time off. And you, yeah. rela- you related it to what we've just been through with COVID. That yeah. everyone's been locked down and the world's had a bit of time to take breath. And we've not we've not been hammering the world in the last yeah. sort of 18 months through COVID as as we do. And the yeah. earth the earth has realized, and you as an environmentalist has realized that oh, the earth needs that a wee bit. The earth needs us yeah. to just back off slightly. And th- that made perfect sense to me. The way and it was funny. And it and it really connected to me. And and I'm just some I'm a I'm a regular guy. Um, I know we have to do better and help our world, but that that made complete sense to me the way that you portrayed that in a silly Earth costume. And it's a bit <laughs> it was. Of, yeah, thank you. I hated that video. I've got to say, I really didn't <laughs> it was like, great. I didn't want. Oh, thank you, but I, I didn't want to release that one because it was terrible. I thought, but anyway, I, I looked like. A, I look like a ridiculous, and, and you know that Earth costume. By the way, it was blowing air. Like it, it, you turn this thing on, and it blows air inside you, and into this big thing. So you're sitting here like this, and the and the thing we kept on like it was so loud. So I was talking over it, and the, where we were filming didn't have aircon. So that thing was I was just sweating like anything in that thing. Trying like <laughs> anyway. Anyway, that video was a bit of a nightmare for me, but I appreciate that. Yeah, it's um, it's hard to find ways that are more relatable to the public in that sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm trying to to find ways like that, like that annual applying for annual leave, um, ways that I can sort of deliver those messages better. It's it's fun for me as well. I would much rather talk serious, much rather go down the science route than than trying to make those ridiculous videos but um but it's also it's also a lot of fun doing it and I, and I know that it works you know people do find it um funny when someone else dresses up as a costume as long as it's not them you know as long as you're taking the piss out of yourself which is this aussie kind of humor as well as like just take the piss out of yourself um uh, you know people people tend to enjoy it and i think i've built my following off off doing that not taking myself too seriously but mixing those environmental messages in with it yeah, but but even that that sketch that you did wearing the earth that will relate to my kids. That will relate to other people that will keep their attention rather than don't take this the wrong way. That will will it keep their attention? You on stage talking about the hard facts, or yeah. will, the, will the message get across better that you're having a bit of fun with it? It it does get across better, and it did certainly to me because I watched a heck of a lot, and I have watched a lot of your your videos, and the content's excellent. But that one really resonated to me because it, it was so current as well. So can you dive into yeah. that a little bit, just how COVID has affected has affected our world and, and what areas may have improved slightly? And do you think the, the powers that be will listen and see, or are we just going to end up going back to the way we were? I think that we're going to end up going back to the way that we were, like we are now. I mean, the science is saying that, that um, COVID, in terms of 
carbon dioxide emission levels. It didn't really impact it too much. Um, but it, it, like you say, that it was, it's a good concept is that we just need to get, think of better ways to do things because we're not going to stop growing as a population or, or needing more things, you know, um, we'll start slowing down as a population growth rate soon, which is really important. Uh, but we, we still need everything. We still need mining. We still need food because we're still buying stuff. We're still building new houses. We're still buying new cars, you know, so all this stuff is going to keep on going. It's just working out better ways to, to do it, um, more sustainable, more regenerative ways to do it. And, and regenerative by regenerative, I mean, we need to think of ways that actually restore our environment to full health rather than degrade them. So, for example, the, the entire economy around the world is based on the degeneration of nature and degeneration meaning, you know, clearing land. Like, so the Amazon rainforest is worth more cleared for agriculture and, agri and food production than it is standing, which is why it's being cleared right now. Um, so if we base the economy on uh, that Amazon rainforest being worth more, uh, then standing that what it is cleared, then we can start to regenerate the entire world. And regenerate means tree growth, you know, soil health growth, the rest of it. So the way to do that is to think of carbon as a building block of life. Um, we're all made up of carbon, you, I, uh, the wood, the soil, the oceans, it all is made up of carbon, this solid sort of chemical or substance, sorry. Um, when we burn it, from coal, from fossil fuels, etc., it releases, car it turns into carbon dioxide, which is a gas, and it creates this, you know, thick blanket around the atmosphere. That thick blanket is trapping heat, uh, uh, more heat than what the world can cope with right now. So that that's actually a natural process. The the world has balanced itself out with carbon dioxide to act as this blanket because so it's kept the earth within a regular temperature for the last um, billion years a couple of billion years um, but the problem is is that we're putting we're just we've got too much in the atmosphere right now what we're doing is just too much we're spewing too much we're burning too much fossil fuels we're cutting down too many trees the trees are actually they're, they're a, like, um, a form of mining. So they mine that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere through the photosynthesis process, which is the light, you know, um, using the light, uh, the solar plant cycle to, to take that carbon dioxide, turn it into oxygen and store it as carbon in the soil and, and the trees. So we can go along. If you think, so going back to the concept of thinking carbon as the building block of life, um, uh, it, it really is essential to all life on earth. And so if we think of it like that, we need to create a block on top of a block, a carbon block on top of a block. What if we valued that carbon block? Because, because it's life, right? So what if we placed a value on it, like oil, like gold? And carbon is a natural resource like any other. It is like gold. It is like oil. So we can put a price on it, a value on it, because it, it, it is valuable to us. You know, it's life. Um, so if we put a price on it, if we value it like gold, because it is gold, and we apply that Indigenous mindset of nature is valuable, um, we understand nature and we, we need to create it and regenerate it, uh, then we can base an entire economy on the regeneration of nature, not degeneration, which is essentially what I do. These are priced on carbon right now because um, when the Paris Climate Agreement came in in 2015, 22 countries signed on to that agreement uh, to reduce carbon emissions. Australia went, right, well, this is how we're going to do it. We're going to do an emissions reduction fund, which is a price on carbon basically. And then I go along and I, you know, plant trees on land or um, get, give the farmers money to grow those trees, et cetera, and they can get paid for that tree growth rate. So it's really, it's growing money on trees in a way. That is the way that I think we can solve the world is, is by slowing, yes, slowing down what we're doing and slowing down our consumption rate and stuff, but also by um, just flipping the models that we already use. It's like I live in this beautiful apartment right now, this sub penthouse overlooking this lake I've just got over here. Um, and, you know, I drive a brand new car that I've got with my company, my carbon company. 
But my carbon footprint is basically like zero at the moment because this entire apartment is sourced from 100% renewable energy. So I've got no carbon footprint with um, um, renewable energy there. And, and the car itself is, is hybrid. We couldn't get a fully electric, but it's, it's hybrid, which means there's only like a litre to every 100, 100 kilometres, which is really minimal carbon dioxide emissions. Um, and I offset that anyway with the work that I do. And then I, I you know, I have a higher plant-based diet and then any meat that I do eat is low carbon-based or regen- sourced from regenerative farms. So, like, I'm saying that you can live well. You, you can actually have a good lifestyle while still being environmentally friendly. Like, I haven't changed much of my lifestyle right now, what I'm doing. I still live in a really nice apartment um, and, and I still have a really nice car but I'm just, uh, my carbon footprint is low. So I'm not emitting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. I'm actually staying neutral. Does that make sense? It it does. But a a question that some people or listeners may have is, what's the expense like? Is it more expensive to live carbon neutral? You know, what's... Not not in Australia. Um, No, so there was no difference in price for me, um, for the, uh, um, it was actually cheaper. It's actually cheaper per quarter for me to go 100% renewable energy through this um, energy dealer. All I did was um, ring up, you know, they they came to me when I moved into this apartment. They came to me with, you know, a heap of different energy companies that I could take a deal with. And all I did was like, which one's renewable energy? And I want 100% renewable energy. And they're like, well, this one. And I looked at the price. They're actually cheaper, like $20 well, they said that they could be work out, you know, twenty to fifty dollars cheaper per quarter, um, or per kilowatt hour or whatever over a certain amount of kilowatt hours. So yeah, no, nothing. And the car itself is is just a, a new Toyota Kluger. Um, so it, it's it's just the same price as a as a normal Kluger. You know, they're, they're, the Toyotas are pretty expensive in general. Um, so the, and then it's a hybrid car, but they're the same price. You know, if you're going to pay for a Toyota Kluger, which most people have in Australia, or you know the Toyotas, um, then there's no difference in, in that type of that type of price at all. So what I'm saying is, is that to go there is is a bit of a misconception these days. As more renewable energy comes into the world, you know, it's driving that price down, not up. Yeah, it's going down. Um, and, um, and the retailer wholesale prices driving down at the same time so it, it's not it's easy to do and it's also cheap i think that's that's an area that myself included needs more needs educated more or shown the way by guys like yourself that making these changes is possible and it's not a it's not a giant leap no it's yeah finances or lifestyle change that, that we we do think because we're so set in our ways of the diesel car and 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 doing the thing that our parents did and what we did and our children are just going to copy and do the same thing as mum and dad until we are forced and then we then when we become forced to change we'll we'll rebel and we'll say god i hate this i don't want to change but listening to you and and detail that no it is possible if you just take the ask the right questions about well which companies are renewable or how do i get this that that education is what i certainly need more and how you, and why you stood out to me the way that you communicate it? Yeah, honestly, um, people get a bit up in arms about this. Exactly as you said, like it, oh, it's it's too hard. It's all too hard. I don't want to change. Yeah. And, and um, I myself, I, I don't really want to change that much. I really like the little luxuries that I have in life, you know. And that, what I'm saying is that it's actually not. The, the number one thing that you need to do is, yes, ask better questions. It's about that mindset shift. It's just thinking differently because if you go out into the shops and you go and you've got, you, you don't have any environmental mindset at all. I mean, you, you're not going to buy something based on it's the amount of plastic that it has, are you? Like you, you just, you're just not because you're not thinking that way. What if you go in with the mindset, it's like, okay, I'm going to try and reduce as much plastic as I can today and not so much that I'm not going to be able to live, I'm not going to be able to buy certain things because I want to eat healthy. So some things do have plastic wrapped around them, so I'm going to buy that. But what if I went in with the mindset, it's just how can I reduce my plastic consumption by 20% this week? And you go in with that mindset and you're going to look for better ways to do things. There, there are honestly, it's all it is, is just looking for better ways to do stuff that doesn't cost you a huge amount. It's not a huge lifestyle change. 
but it's big enough to make a difference in some way or other. Because if everyone went in with that mindset shift, if everyone made a difference in their own way, no matter how big or how small, then you've got 7 billion people in the world making an impact in that way. And that's that's not any more difficult than, yeah, um, changing an energy provider or whatever it is. Like it was not difficult for me changing an energy provider. And I didn't even change. It was when I moved into this apartment, I was just like, right, Who's a renewable energy provider? I'm going to go with them, you know, and it didn't, was no cost difference. It was actually cheaper in some ways, like I said before. And, um, and it really made no difference to my life, whether, you know, it makes no difference to the lights here. The lights still work. Everything works. I'm just running on renewable energy. So it's just, I don't know, it's easier. It's easier than what people think it is, is I guess is what I'm saying. You mentioned earlier that the population growth is going to slow down. Why, why is that or what's going to change? It's a theory, right? So the population growth in 2050, by 2050, is going to go from 7 billion to 10 billion. That's the, the actual prediction. Um, so it's it's growing. It's, it's exponentially growing, which is not a good thing. We need to slow it down. But it, the theory is based on not just on my theory. It's, um, you know, it's based on social science and the rest of it. Um, or where the world's headed, but as things, as the climate change changes uh, start to get more dramatic, uh, there's other pressures, the social pressures, there's environmental pressures with, with less food, you know, we go through longer droughts, um, things get more expensive in general, like it gets more expensive to buy land, to build houses, etc. People aren't going to be able to afford a kid or, th- or three kids, so we're going to reduce, you know, a family may want, I talk to a, a lot of women and, and um, families these days and they're like, oh, I want, I want three or four kids. You know, I love kids, so I'm going to have as many as I can. They're not going to be able to afford to do that. You know, um, things are going to get more expensive anyway. Food is going to get more expensive and less. Uh, there's going to be less of it or less available as droughts get harder and the rest of it, climate shift starts ramping up. So people aren't going to be able to afford this. So I think that's naturally going to slow the population growth down. Uh, also, the number six solution uh, in, in the world, top solution to climate change is empowering women, especially in uh, developing countries uh, where there's no family planning, there's no education. Uh, so the, the women will just have kids at a very young age and they'll have multiple kids over the course of their, their life. So that that's really driving the population up. And obviously over the course of that kid's life, their carbon footprint is enormous, right? So the biggest thing you can do for climate change or the environment in general is to have one less kid in your family. Better family planning um, is the best environmental impact overall. So empowering women with education and um, uh, those type of solutions like that, then that that's a very, very big solution uh, to, to climate overall. So, yeah, I, I guess... There's some theories based that the population will rate will slow based on that, and the world will not be able to cope with 10 billion people. Can't even cope with 7 billion that we're at now. So, um, but who who knows? No one can really predict what's going to happen. But um, hopefully, it does slow to some some extent because we need it to. It's commendable what you're doing, and even in those conversations with women. And, and telling them about the effect that having more children will have on the world, it can't be an easy conversation. Let, let alone you walk into a, a farmer's courtyard and try to talk about you need to plant more trees, you need to stop, you need to stop farming on so much land. The conversations that you have, they're brave conversations, and you're putting yourself out there for for um, for resistance. You know. Oh, yeah. It, that must be something that you've you've grown over time a sort of thick skin to keep coming back to maybe going at a different going at a different angle or, or come a different way. How, how do you how do you deal with the the rejection or the people that just point blank aren't interested in what you're talking about? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. I think, um, uh, like I said, it's gotten a lot easier over time. But the other angle to go with it is is there are just some people that you, you there's no talking to at all. And yeah. I have gotten very good at human psychology, I'd say. I, I, 
learn a lot about people and the human mind and how it works um, so that I can communicate those messages better. So if I deliver something poorly and that person reacts poorly, I just go, well, it's not really about me. It's not my ego getting in this. Uh, you know, it's nothing to do with me in the end. Um, it, I'm trying to do this. This is a bigger purpose than me. I have a bigger message than myself. Uh, so if, if, you know, anything that's directed at me personally, I just I get over pretty quickly because it's like, well, I, I don't really care about my own ego, but I need to be very aware, self-aware of myself as, as well because if I'm coming across as arrogant or, or uh, haven't delivered the message properly because my ego is getting in the way or whatever it is, I need to have a look deep inside myself and say, why is that? Why did that person react like that to me? Did I come across a little bit aggressive or, or how, how did I deliver that? Um, and, and I just learned to, to deliver that better because, it, like I said, it's, it's not about me. It's about the message. So if, if I'm not delivering the message properly, then there's no point in me doing this, honestly. Like I'm doing it because I care about people as well as nature. Um, so I just learned to do things better. I, and, yeah, it, the certain I'm human, so that there are things that, you know, in the human mind, you can get a hundred good comments on social media, but that one shit comment, you, your mind just tracks to, you know, and you, you can get, you can stew on that for hours. But I've just gone, you know what? Some people are going to like me, some some are not, and they're never going to like me. And that's okay. Like, I don't really care, but I don't really care about spending time on that one person that's not going to listen or doesn't care or just won't get the message through. There's a lot of flat earthers out there. There's a lot of climate deniers still. Um, I used to spend a lot of time on that group of people saying, oh, we've got to convince them, you know, you've got to find better ways to do things. But no, like that's not my audience. That's not my deal anymore. I don't need to. Um, I've gotten uh, um, bigger than that in my social media following and in everything that I, I do, I guess, now than that. Um, so I don't. I don't actually need to spend the energy on those people. I concentrate on the people that want to listen and try and grow that group. Mm. Because once you start learning about human behavior and, and psychology and stuff, it's like, well, all you need to do is influence that one person over on your side. And then that one person can influence someone else. So you bring three people. Then all of a sudden your group's gone from one, like from me, to two, to three, to ten, and it multiplies very quickly. Uh, um, um, you, you start to see like a cascading uh, waterfall type effect. Once you get to you know fifty people, it starts to like everyone starts running and, and join the group. Like, oh, what's this about? This is very cool. Let's all join in because we're social creatures, right? Like we want to. We're sort of uh, working in mobs, I guess. Um, so the more people that that you can influence and join into your to your circle, the better it is. Um, so I just concentrate on, on the people that want to listen and empowering them to go and talk to someone else because I'm only one person. I'm not going to be able to, I'm never going to be able to influence everyone um, in, the, in the whole world, which is what we need to do. But I can teach others in how to empower others so that my impact is, is multiplied across huge, vast um, uh, quantities of, of, of people rather than me just trying to concentrate and change that one person's mind. Yeah. So I, like I think that's what I've I like the way that you describe it. You've done it previously as a ripple effect and you create enough ripples and the waves start coming. But that, yeah. that, that way that I want to take it to is our oceans. Because we I mean, yeah. the ocean temperatures are slightly colder over here than what you've got, but we do have a surf, a surf culture here and we've got communities like Groundswell that my wife's a director of and, and things like that so there's a lot of good things going on here and across the world that relating to surfing and relating to, to our oceans but what, what are the problems that you see in our oceans and obviously the pollution and everything that goes in but how can we help what's happening in our in our seas to our to our fish to everything in that that sort of environment yeah so the oceans um the oceans are in, in massive trouble uh when I talk about that climate change and, and the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the oceans are one of those carbon regulators. So they draw down, they act the same as trees, like a carbon sink. They draw down or they mine that carbon out of the atmosphere. They store it in the oceans through phytoplankton, through seaweed, um, uh, stuff like that. So they help regulate. The ocean basically controls the whole entire Earth's climate weather system. Uh, so 
what's happening at the moment is that it's going into overdrive. There's so much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that the phytoplankton and everything's working into overdrive and sucking more and more carbon into the into the ocean. So the ocean's becoming more acidic because of that. Um, carbon dioxide can make water more acidic when it stores heaps. So the ocean's becoming more acidic, which means a lot of things die very quickly. The second thing that, that's happening is the ocean takes in 90% of the extra global warming heat. So we've warmed in, uh, in average temperature over the last 100 years by a degree. And uh, for the, uh, the argument's sake out there that the climate has always changed, yes, it has. The only difference now is that it's changing a hell of a lot faster than what it has ever done in history before um, because of the amount that we're putting in the atmosphere and because of our global population rise. So that's making everything in the ocean work in overdrive. It's taking in or is absorbing all the extra heat. So the ocean's warming a hell of a lot faster than, than some land areas and it's also becoming more acidic. So that's like a double whammy. So when you, I don't know if you've heard of coral bleaching events on the on the reefs, the coral reefs, like Great Barrier Reef and stuff. I know about the Great Barrier Reef, and I was going to get to that, but no, I've not heard about the bleaching. Yeah, so the bleaching events is, is like when you get a heat wave, for example, on 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 the land, you know, a a, a big air mass comes through, and it's 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 hot. It's like yeah, it's called a heat wave. Um, those heat waves on land are, are like five five to seven times more likely now because of global warming. So we're getting more heat waves. The same thing happens in the ocean. There's like really hot patches of ocean that get warmed up by the surface through the, the sun, um, around, especially around the equator. They come down in this sort of mass and come across the, the corals and they sit on the corals for a large period of time. Now those corals get stressed out and they start releasing um, all their, 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 um, phytoplank their, their um, photosynthesis cells and everything. So they, they start expelling um, uh, all the algae and everything on them. So they, they go this white colour to, to try and survive, basically. It's like a, a stress mechanism that they have. Um, and if that heat stays on them for too long, they basically they die. Nothing, nothing is going to survive in, in that type of heat stress environment. So that's happened. We've lost 30% of the Great Barrier Reef from um, bleaching. They're called coral bleaching events. We've lost 50% of coral around the world to these bleaching events. In the next 20 years, 20 to 30 years, we're expected to lose the rest of the entire coral all around the world. So the, the entire Great Barrier Reef is going to be gone because um, it gets more acidic as well. So a combination of the acidic um, water as well as uh, temperature uh, rise, it's, it's just going to wipe out everything. Coral reefs are like basically form the foundation of the ocean as well. So a lot of fish species will go with that. Uh, so the, the, <laughs> the point I'm getting, and stay hopeful here because I'm going to bring the hope back in a minute, <laughs> but the, the, the point is, is that the entire ocean is going to die. It doesn't matter, uh, you know, if we go all renewable energy tomorrow, the world's going to keep on heating for a while just because of the legacy load that we've put in the atmosphere. So the ocean's in real trouble over the next 30 years, and we obviously rely on the ocean. It controls the climate system. Uh, we rely on the ocean for food, um, all types of stuff. So with no ocean, there's no world, basically. So we have to intervene into that system and work out different ways to do that. Now, here's the hope. This is what I do a lot of work in. It's uh, very exciting. Um, seaweed. Seaweed is our saviour. It grows 30 to 60 times faster than any land-based plant. Um, and it's a huge carbon sequester. So that in the same way that a tree grows and you can store that carbon safely in that tree, in the wood and in the soil, the seaweed grows and it draws down that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at a very quick rate, stores it, and then you can drop it to the bottom of the ocean. Um, and it closes off that carbon loop. So it doesn't re-enter into the atmosphere when it degrades or whatever over, for over a 1,000 years. We can feed uh, people with seaweed so we can reduce the land pressure for meat and beef on the land and grow it in the ocean instead as a, and have the carbon sequestration benefits as well. They, the scientific leading scientific agency in Australia has also developed a cattle supplement feed out of seaweed. 
um, which eliminates methane emissions in cattle um, through, through burping, which is a huge greenhouse warming or climate change potential. Um, so it eliminates that. So that's another solution to climate change. There's so many benefits to the seaweed product. And um, uh, some of the figures just out of interest, and these figures haven't been you know, properly verified yet. So they're just sort of figures being thrown out there based on carbon, you know, carbon estimates, carbon calculations. But if we use 10% of the ocean for, for open ocean seaweed farming, it can draw down the entire uh, amount of emissions that we're emitting globally every single year, which is about 40 to 50 gigatons of, of carbon dioxide. So we can start to reverse climate change using uh, this, this type of um, farming technology. We can line the Great Barrier Reef and other coral reefs with seaweed farming um, because it's, it's known scientifically to reduce ocean temperatures and store um, the carbon dioxide uh, as carbon. So it reduces the acidity levels as well. So it can act as a buffer zone for, for that, um, the Great Barrier Reef and, and other coral reefs around the world. So it can sort of protect it, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, and in combination with that and with other solutions such as regenerative agriculture, which is what I do on the land, it's just regenerating, growing trees and um, better soil health and that kind of thing. In combination with land and ocean like that, um, <coughs> there's huge potential to reverse global warming, absolutely enormous. And, and that's, that's, I guess, what gives me the hope is that we are seriously in trouble with climate change um, as a world, as, as a species, um, I see the next the predictions for the next uh, 50 years is that we're <coughs> um, going to, it's four to seven degrees rise in temperature, which would basically end all life on earth over, over human lifetime, over the next human lifetime. And we have to reverse that cycle very quickly. So the way to do that is we, we can do that through these sort of um, natural sequestration techniques by growing stuff and, and, and intervening in, in or speeding up, sorry, nature's natural systems already. Um, does that make sense to you? Yeah, 100%. And it, to the point that I'm, a, I'm, I'm, in, I'm shocked, did you, did you see that if we keep going in the way we're going and the temperatures go up four to seven degrees, that I mean, humanity will end? I mean, the world won't be able to cope? In the next, um, in the next human lifetime. Yeah. So if, if uh, you and I have kids, <coughs> I don't see those kids surviving based on the projections currently. Um, I've, so when I've, got, say, I've got three kids. I've, I've, I've got yeah. three and they're, they're, they're babies at the moment. They're, the oldest is seven. You, you think the way that we're going as a humanity, my kids might, they're gonna, their, their life's only going to get harder. I, I th their lives will definitely get harder as it stands now. Um, and... Look, I, I just, I can't see the, I mean, for example, you look at um, Miami over in, in Florida, in America, the, uh, the sea level will rise there and they can't do anything about it. They can't build walls around it. So the projections there, the, the sea level is already rising there. It's, uh, it, they get daytime flooding where the water comes in through the gutters and the streets and everything. And the mayor's spending millions of dollars to lift the entire city and that might buy them 30 years he's saying but basically the whole entire city is going to be underwater in the next um, 40 40 years or so so that's millions of people displaced from an entire city for starters that's just one area that's happening all over the world and, and like and then we're getting these droughts and bushfires. Um, uh, um, it, we're more susceptible to disease like COVID. I think the world is going to get extremely difficult, even in your my lifetime, like it is now. If you look over the last 10 years and the climate extremes is, what, is what's happened over the last 10 years, we multiply that by 40, 40 years, um, then, you know, it's hard to predict what humans will do and what we're capable of and surviving in. But um, the extinction rate is, is the equivalent now of, of the fastest extinction rate in, in history besides the dinosaurs. We're wiping out 
animals across the entire world as fast as what the meteor strike was strike was 65 million years ago so what we're doing to the the planet has the equivalent impact of a, of of the meteorite impact which ended all life on earth so there is no doubt that you know, over the next 100 years there won't be a planet if we keep on doing the going the way that we are um it's whether we want to survive on this planet or not um we can't survive in a world that's warmed four to seven degrees, which is the prediction by 2100, the world will rise four to seven degrees. There's no possible way that a human can survive in, in that type of condition. So <laughs> we have to work out ways to stop that. And so when people say the climate crisis, that's what they're talking about. It's like, and it's very, very hard for people to comprehend this because they're like, oh, well, you're talking about a crisis, you know, you're talking about the world ending. Mate, the sun's going to still get up tomorrow. You know, what are you talking about? Like, I'm fine. I'm fine. You're fine. Like, you, you're saying that I need to act immediately. I don't need to do anything. The world's fine. You look around. Everything works, doesn't that, it? That is, like, so, that is so true. That, that is, that's where I am with this, that we hear heat wave. The average man and woman hears heat wave and we think, brilliant, summer's coming. You know? Yeah. Let's yeah, enjoy it. Summer, yeah. Let, let's, yeah. If we hear a heat wave's coming and then you, we're looking at the temperatures, oh, it's going to be 20 degrees, you know? Yeah, but let's get the paddling yeah. pool out. Get the get the barbecue set up. Um, yeah. I don't think. Oh shit! Uh, this is a problem. That isn't what triggers in my mind, but it is now. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's the uh, um, the longer term effects. So the human brain, we have a amygdala in the back of our back of our brain, which is reactive. We're used to running away from saber toothed tigers, which means now, like we run now, we have to run away from danger right now so we're reactive we're not proactive climate change is one of those problems where it's just, it's slow enough it's happening so quickly in terms of geological in terms of the history of, of the planet itself this is the fastest that any temperature has changed in history as far as as far as we know um, and we're causing that but it's happening slow enough in a human life cycle that we can't comprehend it because we're used to running away from the saber-toothed tiger. We're not used to dealing with a 50-year problem, you know. Um, and the problem is, is that we have to deal with it right now. We have to put the solutions in place right now to have an impact in over that long course because the climate takes a long time to change. Um, so what we're putting up in the atmosphere now may not be felt for another 20 to 30 years. It may not have that warming impact for another 20, 30 years. The same goes for the um, the the answers, the uh, the the uh, solutions like renewable energy, like the carbon dioxide drawdown with seaweed. We have to put the solutions in now to to have the effect of the reversing warming potential. Um, you know, thirty years down the track. And a really interesting saying of, of that is um, that I read the other day it was like, you don't plant a tree. To enjoy that tree now you plant a tree so that someone else so that your kid can enjoy the shade of that tree you know 30 years later um so that we need to do we need to apply that same concept now is like we need to understand the climate science climate science is saying that yep yeah, we're pretty much absolutely stuffed as a human race um if we don't do something but I say that because it's like it is really serious. The climate science is the projections. We should be taking them a lot more seriously as a, as a world, as human, as a human race than what we are probably, um, because that it, it's it's incredibly scary once you start to drill down into the actual science and and understand it and understand everything that we do has a huge impact on the world. Um, and the way that it'll turn out. But the other side of that is that there's there's incredible solutions out there and those solutions can work equally as fast. Um, and, and like we've seen what happened when we, we had COVID, you know, the world locked down. This, you know, a year and a half ago, if, if you'd come to me and said, the whole world's going to shut down, you know, overnight and we're going to go into complete lockdown for six months, no one's going to do anything. We're just going to sit in our homes. The economy is going to shut down. No one's going to have jobs. And you'd be like, yeah, right, mate, whatever. Like, pull the, pull the other one. But the world came together and it shut down. The entire world shut down, coordinated, a coordinated approach to a threat that we thought was a legitimate threat that would, you know, harm the human race. We need to apply that same level of thinking 
to climate change. We need to start not shut down the world in, in the way that I'm saying. We need to keep on living and doing the things that we're doing, but we need to apply that mindset. It's like, what can we do now to take this threat seriously? Because, we, you know, um, if we don't address it now, it's going to be it's going to make it much, much harder to address later. And the, and the human mind doesn't really work like that. Like we also saw, uh, you know, the more primitive side of the human mind come out during COVID where we fought over, well, I don't know, you know, what happened over there, but we were fighting, like there were images of people fighting over toilet paper in, the, in Woolworths, you know, because they thought it was going to run out. You know, that's just ridiculous. But imagine what happens when we run out of food. You know, if there's a worldwide food shortage and it is actually a real threat to, you know, families and stuff where we're, we're, people are starving yeah. and they're doing stuff for survival. I mean, that's where stuff gets a bit serious. So we, we need to think about that So um, and address those type of issues. So I don't, you know, and I'm definitely not an alarmist. I bring across the science. I've been trained in scientific um, climate modelling and everything. And I think the climate modelling is um, actually pretty conservative and only takes into account our emissions. There are a lot of feedback loops that are now being set off around the world. And what I mean by feedback loops is that, is that the faster the world warms, uh, the ice is, is melting a lot faster and that ice has trapped methane bubbles. Um, and the methane is like 25 to 30 times um, has more global warming potential. It heats up the world a lot faster than what carbon dioxide does. So it releases into the atmosphere from the ice melting and that speeds up the whole warming process because it's melting it's releasing more methane etc and they're not the, the models the climate models don't take those feedback loops into account there are thousands of those feedback loops going on all the time now just being triggered um, so it's like again it's like a waterfall effect it you know we're hitting these ecological tipping points now where the world can take and take and take what we've done all of a sudden we're at that point right on the edge of the waterfall and once we hit that waterfall it's like it's all downhill from there so we're right at that point in history now where we can do something about this if we act in the next 10 to 15 years but we do have to um, act now and take take this a little bit more seriously than what we are yeah. A lot of us are, are paying attention to Elon Musk and he's trying to get to Mars and he's trying to colonize it and he's trying to get people or create the ability to live on Mars. Is is he looking at this stuff that you're talking about thinking, we're not going to be here in 100 years. We, we need to try and save humanity and, and work out what other planets we can go to. Is that, is that hey, part of his plan and what he's doing? Oh, I think so. I think he'd absolutely be doing that. Um, but... I think that we, this planet is worth saving, to be honest. I, I think that we should be focusing our full energy and time on this planet. So whatever Elon Musk is doing, like his head is in the fairies land sometimes. He's done bloody well. You know, he's doing really good things for the world. But I think with the whole Mars stuff, we've only got one planet. You know, we're not going to live on Mars. Um, this planet's a good one. And it's still livable. So let's let's try and save it, is my opinion. We, we, there will, there will undoubtedly be people that listen to this thinking, oh, what is, what's this guy talking about? Turn it off. I'm not interested. Where can people go and, and read more about this? Where, where do you recommend? What's, where is telling the truth right now? That, yeah. That's actually happening and the, the real talk because you have, you're saying you're not an alarmist and, and, I, and I know you're not and I follow all your stuff, but my God, I, I've never thought about the way you've just described things i've never yeah because I, I, I it, it is in me that think well i'm going to get through my life you know and yeah. kids are they going to get to 80 90 yeah the world will still be here that's in my mind that's that's yeah. how a lot of us operate that we don't actually think and worry it'll be all right it doesn't really affect me but yeah if you're saying the future yeah. generations if we don't act now are not going to have a world and if my yeah. kid, if I can't become a granddad, um, that's a real problem for me. It's a it's a really hard thing to comprehend. And and what I'm saying is that it is going to affect you and I. I think in another we will we will be living in a completely different world by the time we're 50, 60. Um, the world is going to change now, no matter what we do. Um, and how severe those changes are is is up to us. I think that's the point that I'm making is that. 
yeah, there's no doubt in anyone's, any scientist's mind that there, there will not be a livable future for humanity in the next human lifetime. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Scientists are very afraid of saying that because it's hard to predict what humans will do. Like we might live underground and we'll be all right underground and we'll grow things hydroponically. But whatever happens, we're not going to have the life that we're living now unless we change now, if that makes sense. Um, and that's very hard to comprehend because we're all living really beautiful, amazing lives now. But the, the climate science is, is absolutely certain, is actually conservative. Like I was saying before, I think the models are, are wrong. There's, there's, I think it's going to happen a lot faster than what they say it's going to happen. And that's why when you hear scientists saying, oh, it's good. this is happening a lot faster, the ice is melting a lot faster, it's because of those feedback loops, because their climate models don't take those feedback loops into place. Um, so things are happening a lot faster than what we, we think it is. But, I mean, this information is all over. Anyone can go and access it at, at any given time. Um, the problem is, is people don't know what to look for uh, and what's legitimate and what's not. So if you haven't been to university, you don't know how to look at a peer-reviewed um, literature article or whatever, that's fine. But you need to trust certain scientific agencies like the NOAA, NASA, um, uh, if you watch, uh, but if you're more of uh, watching documentaries, that type of thing, I mean, there's hundreds out them of, of, not hundreds, but there's a lot of really good ones out there right now, like Al Gore's one, um, The Inconvenient Truth, and his most recent one, Power to Truth, that really explains the science. Um, from NASA, like it's all referenced from, from those uh, big leading scientific agencies, there's enough information out there if people really wanted to dig down into it that um, you could you could scare the hell out of yourself. Um, but I tend to just, uh, like I'm a commu science communicator, so I tend to communicate that message and say, yep, yeah, we've got a real problem, but we need to focus on the solutions. Like don't, don't worry about that problem so much. Like whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Um, if we want to fix that problem, we we must focus on the solutions now. It's like there's no it's there's no um, point in going down that path anymore and, and and worrying about your kids or whatever. It's like, well, what can I do right now that will help make an impact over here? You know what I mean? To start re reverse that. So that's what I try and get people to do now, and that's what I primarily focus on. That's why you wouldn't have seen much stuff on 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 that type of alarmist type stuff is because I, there's no for me there's not much point in talking about that um too much i think that people really need to realize how much trouble we are in but i don't spend too much time on it uh, uh, anymore I, I definitely go well this is what we can do about it. the solutions are much more exciting than the problem like i don't want to focus on the problem it scares the shit out of me do you no okay well let's go over here you know what i mean yeah me so that's why I, yeah that's what I tend to do in my work now is I just um, empower people with what they, they can do in their own lives without, without changing too much, if you know what I mean, because we don't actually have to. We just have to flip the model and, and flip our thinking. Well, Corey, I mean, you've got a, you've got a follower here. Uh, I'm listening to what you're saying. <laughs> and I'll be trying to spread your, your good word and your knowledge as best I can over this side of the world because it's important. And as a dad... I'm now worried. I'm more worried than I, I was when I woke up this morning. You know. Well, I, <laughs> I don't. I don't. I didn't want to. Um, uh, I mean that in a good way. I mean that in a good way. I'm now. Edu I'm now a little bit more educated. Yeah. I'm taking to. I, I reach out in my show, and I want to. I want to speak to people that interest me. That that can take. That I can help promote their message or hear about their journey or the, the troubles they've been through. My, my, my guests vary from all walks of life. And, and you are by far one of the most interesting because it's, it's so, what you've talked about is so personal to me with, with the way I look at my kids and the way I, I every day just go about my, my, my life. We do mm -hmm. recycle. We do have that blue, blue and green bin. We do put the cardboard there. We do put the book back. My, am I doing enough? I don't think I am. The, the way you talk about it and things, I, I do have a diesel big van out, big bus outside, you know, because we've got <laughs> three kids and we've got the dog and we've got the, the shopping to get in and, and it's comfortable for us. But do I need to look at something different? I, I don't know. I, I need to sort of sit, sit back and re-listen to this and edit this show and, and 
and digest it all again because I don't know. You've 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 really you've really opened my eyes to, to what we're doing to ourselves. Yeah, but I I think you're thinking along the right path as well. I, I think you just need to um, um, question what you're doing and yeah. better ways you can do things. I, I wouldn't get too caught up in it. Like uh, you know, I I think if you recycle, if you change your energy, or we look at changing the energy provider if you can, or putting solar panels on your roof. Just look at uh, what is affordable. Um, for yourself and your family um, changing diet is the, probably one of the biggest things that you can do is go more plant-based um, reduce meat intake and all that kind of stuff um, just look at, at different ways that you can do things for you and your family and not something that's not going to make a big enough impact or you're not comfortable with you're just, just doing it for whatever but not something that's so big that you know, it takes so much effort to do because you're probably not going to do it. It's not going to be lasting. You need to make those lasting changes. And, and um, I think that's the important thing and teaching your kids to make those lasting changes so that they can influence everyone else. Because one of the things that I, I talk about is that, you know, if you, ch- if you have a changed heart and mind, then that can then be a very powerful tool to influence others. And, and your impact can go way beyond um, just uh, your recycling bin, you know what I mean? It can have, it. Can, you can be influencing people to recycle that wouldn't have normally recycled, you know, you, you could influence a thousand people in two years um, without even knowing that you've influenced it because your kids have talked to someone else and their friends and their friends have talked to their parents and now their parents are doing it. You know what I mean? It has a multiple effect that we can't, can't quite see but it's a very, very powerful ripple effect um, that we can have on the world just through our own changed heart and mind. Um, and that, that starts with you. So I wouldn't get too caught up in, in wanting to do more or anything. It's just, it, honestly, it's that changed mindset. It's just asking yourself better questions. It's like, how could I do this better? How, how could I go about my life better while making the impact that I'm comfortable with? Um, and that's what I really try and encourage people to do because um, otherwise we're not we're not going to act on, on it. You know, we're not going to make those lasting changes that we need. I guess the last thing for me, and, and you mentioned, if the world was up in degrees or four to seven degrees, what will the world be like? What what what, what will that create? Because I can't comprehend that. I can't work that out in my head. What 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 will change? Yeah. Yeah. At the moment, over the last 10 years, the extreme temperatures um, have increased dramatically uh, with every degree rise in temperature and average temperature, the atmosphere's, atmosphere's capacity to hold more water vapour increases by 7%, which basically means as the world gets hotter, there's more vapour, there's more water in the atmosphere, it can hold more, which is why we're seeing more floods occur all around the world because it's coming down harder and faster. So it's basically washing away topsoils, washing away entire towns, and villages, et cetera. Um, but then we have the extreme droughts as well because it's hotter and drier, we get extreme droughts. So basically what's happening now is that we're getting extreme droughts, we're getting more energy in the atmosphere, which is creating more cyclones, more hurricanes, um, et cetera, stronger weather systems, more lightning, everything like that, um, stronger, longer, more intense droughts. You times that by three or four times um, and you ha- you see a completely different world. There are entire areas in Queensland right now that are becoming uninhabitable that used to, you know, 20 years ago, it was flourishing with um, trees and grasses and, and everything. Now it's um, desert country, you know, and that desert country, it, we got a lot of inland Western areas in, in um, Queensland and Australia. And now it's just creeping inland towards the coast because the coast is the, the wet area, obviously it gets drier inland, but that desertification is creeping inland, which means the entire areas of Australia that are just are becoming uninhabitable. You can't grow food on it now let alone in 10, 20 years. So I guess what I'm saying is that the just areas will become barren, like the areas that are already drought prone are just going to get more drought prone. We, we're going to create um, huge areas of deserts across the world um, and, and less land to grow food on. So food's going to become more scarce. Um, uh, weather events are going to become more extreme. It's, it's, it's a world, it's a very... If you paint the picture in that sense, it's a very dark 
world. Um, and the world, the vision that I try and create is like, well, through regenerative agriculture, through growing more trees, better soil health, we can actually turn those deserts to grasslands now um, because within that climate sort of projection area, which is in the next 10 to 15 years, um, because it's a livable conditions now. You know, in the next 10 to 15 years, there's, we, we're still in that livable area where we can still grow stuff. You know, we can still make a difference in that area. Um, if, if we get 15 years, 15, 20 years down the track and the world has warmed, you know, and there's more, uh, uh, more heat waves coming through which just knock over plants, uh, more extreme weather events, it just gets too hard to grow anything. It's too late by then, you know, so we can't start reversing these changes. Uh, so I think we need to paint that beautiful picture of the world regenerated, turning deserts to grasslands, turning oceans into beautiful coral reefs again, healthy and thriving, rather than painting the picture of this is what it could look like, because that is what it could look like. But I tend to paint the picture of, uh, of, of um, what it could like if we applied the best practices, environmental practices that we have available to us now. You know, all the solutions that we need are right in our hands at this very minute. We don't need to wait for extreme technologies, uh, technological advances to come along to save us. Like we have everything that we need to implement this at this very time. It's, it's literally just that mindset shift. It's literally every single one of us asking in our businesses, in our careers, in our lives at home. It's like, what can we, what can we do better here? You know, what, what can I do better? How can I influence my boss or CEO to put solar panels on the roof and go more renewable? Or can I offset my carbon and put it into um, um, growing a tree somewhere? Or can I grow my own food in my backyard? Or can I, can I compost uh, my food waste? Uh, or, or can I do have better family planning? Like, do I need three kids? Can I have two and still be happy? You know, it's just asking ourselves those, those type of questions yeah. um, and what we're comfortable with because um, I, I really want to paint a world that's worth living. I, I don't tend to go down that dark path. Uh, and a lot of climate scientists in the past have, have tended to paint that dark picture and just said, well, we're all, we're all stuffed. That's what, you're gonna, that's what we're doing to the world. But then they don't provide an alternative solution. They don't go, oh, well, this is what we could do um, because we can do it. They don't. They just go, oh, no, you guys need to stop. You know, the big corporates and the governments need to fix this. It's like, well, no. You know, we all have a carbon footprint. We all contribute to this problem, which means we can all be part of the solution in some way. So we need to empower each other to be part of that solution rather than part of the problem. Um, and that's and and like I'm saying to you, like we've been saying the whole time, that's really not that difficult, you know. To make a difference, um, it's really not that hard. I, I've made a difference, and uh, I, I would it hasn't made my life any more difficult than what it, it needs to be. You know what I mean? Mate, good on you. you you're um, you're spreading the good word, and you're trying to, to yeah, you're trying to help our world and, and our future generations. So I, I, I say thank you, thank you for that. And I I didn't. I don't know what I was expecting because your your environmental cowboy persona is extremely serious, but there's a there's a really interesting I want this comedy side to it that really caught my attention, and I think it gets that message across. But the way you speak here, without that persona and just you talking about what we're doing to our world, is an eye opener. So thank you very much for for taking the time and speaking to me. No, I appreciate that, mate. Thank you. I, I think um, I think I probably draw people in with that persona a little bit and get them with the funny stuff. And then all of a sudden I go, bang, you know, <laughs> nail them with the messages. So, no, I appreciate you having me on, mate. This is the first time I've done an international podcast. So I, I, um, I'm looking forward to watching it back. And I've watched a couple of your ones now. So you're a bloody good host. It's uh, really entertaining. So I'm really, really appreciate to go on here. And uh, if you ever want to do a second one, we or talk about something specific. We can, of course, do that as well. We, we will. Let's do one down the line. We'll maybe also, if it's if it's up, if you're all right with it, maybe do an Instagram live because getting you right live into people's phones as they sit there at night scrolling, watching Sea Spiracy and do nothing about it, and and you know watching all these things, these documentaries out there, that's probably another another podcast we could do on Sea Spiracy and all the all the Netflix documentaries and things are out there that you you give your opinion on these things. We'll maybe do that another time as well. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. In, in the meantime, um, have a look on, if you're talking about Netflix, have a look at Kiss the Ground. Um, it's uh, the, the new one on regenerative agriculture that has come out, which is mainly what I do in that carbon carbon sort of space. So yeah, if you want to have a little bit more of a listen to that and 2040 Regeneration, it's an Australian film that was made, um, that's got a lot of solutions in it as well. So there are a lot of really good films out there with talking about the solutions that uh, I talk about if anyone wants to dig a bit deeper into it. Awesome. Well, thank you, Corey, for, for joining me. We'll catch up soon. Awesome. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it.